If you've ever wondered how your favorite Korean beauty products get made, who the big players are in manufacturing, and which companies own which brands in K-beauty, then stick around. On today's episode, which is the first in a two-part series, we're deep diving on how Korean beauty products are actually made. Welcome to The Korean Beauty Show, where we're talking all things Korean skincare, makeup, and more. If you want to learn about the hottest trending products and ingredients straight from South Korea, then this is the podcast for you. Each week, we'll be diving in to take a look at the latest trends, as well as all the tips and tricks you need to perfect your K-beauty routine. I'm your host, Lauren Lee, professional K-beauty expert and founder of Korean beauty platform Style Story. Today's podcast episode is brought to you by Style Story. Get free domestic shipping all month in July with the code PODCAST on stylestory.com.au. Hello and welcome back to another week of the podcast. If we haven't already met, then welcome. Really glad to have you here. I am the host of the show. I am a K-beauty lover, a manufacturer, exporter, distributor, regulatory consultant. Uh, I work with brands, retailers, and manufacturers in the Korean beauty beauty industry, rather, both here in Korea uh, and back home in Australia, which is where I'm originally from, uh, and in many other countries as well. So if you are joining us for the very first time, then really glad to have you here, and I hope that you will enjoy today's episode. So for everyone who is rejoining for another week, you probably will have heard in some of the more recent episodes that I said I was going to try something a little bit different and do a deep dive into the Korean beauty industry and in particular how products are actually made. So this is the first time that I'm I'm trialing something like this. So as always, I would love to know your feedback, whether you enjoy this kind of like a deeper dive into the industry uh, or whether you prefer our normal uh, episode. So do let me know. Come and find me on Instagram. I am at lauren.kbeauty. I would love to hear your thoughts and feedback. But first, let's start with our K-Beauty news headlines. So Korea's cosmetics exports reached a new record last year in 2020. According to the Korea Customs Service, Korea exported US $6.12 billion worth of cosmetics in 2020, which was actually up 14.8% from the previous year. So in the first quarter of this year, exports grew 32.4% year on year with skincare products leading the way with an increase of 24%. Makeup sales were down likely due to the impact of working from home and mask wearing. The biggest importers of Korean cosmetics are China, Hong Kong, the US, Japan and Vietnam. So Korea's imports of cosmetics fell 10.7% on year in 2020, which leaves them at a total of $1.07 billion. So that's a little bit interesting. Korea is importing less than usual, but exporting much, much more than usual. So I think that was a really good year for a lot of people in the industry. And it seems that that trend is continuing on into this year. So that is what was making headlines in Korea in the industry at the moment. So now on to today's topic, and this is something that I obviously know a lot about having worked in the industry for so long, but I think I tend to forget sometimes that other people like don't know this stuff, obviously, but that they might be interested to know a little bit more about how the industry actually works behind the scenes, uh, you know, because it's not all just about product releases and, you know, whiz bang new ingredients and things like that. This is obviously, as you can tell from the news headlines, it's a really 
really big part of Korea's uh, industry and how the country actually makes money uh, and, and, you know, the kind of things that people inside the country are employed by, who they're employed by and where the money is flowing. So I think uh, I thought it might be good to actually take a look at how all of that sort of works. How does this industry, nuts and bolts, work on the ground behind the scenes. So before I sort of deep dive into all of that and, you know, who the big players are and who owns who in K-beauty, I thought it might be interesting to just sort of take a bit of a step back at and have a look at the industry generally. So obviously the size of the market is really huge and that is very clear from the export figures. It is dominated by two players, I would say. The two big ones are Amore Pacific and then LG Household and Healthcare. And it is literally no exaggeration, I think, to say that Korea's national economy really has been built on the back of export in general, not just with K-beauty, but exporting a whole lot of different things. So after the Korean War, the country was decimated, basically. It had a GDP the size of countries in sub-Saharan Africa. So Korea was very, very poor. uh, And as a country, they actually have very few natural resources, so to speak of. So where I'm from in Australia, our economy was always based on our natural resources that we could export overseas. Things like coal, things like, um, you know, cotton, things like... um, animals themselves or wool from sheep, things like that. Whereas Korea didn't really have anything like that. However, today in 2021, Korea has the world's 10th largest economy. So they have basically gone from being as poor as a country in sub-Saharan Africa just after the war. And then in the space of, I guess, 70 years, they are now one of the world's richest economies. And that turnaround is 100% due to Korea's exports. Korea builds things and then sells them overseas. That's how the country has come this far. That's how it has made its money. And historically, the government has identified sectors for Korea to focus on for its exports. So things like cars, semiconductors, and these days, cosmetics are also at the top of the list. So there is a national trade agency here in Korea, Kotra is the name, and they play a really big role in promoting and assisting companies to export their products overseas. So that's sort of like the background to how and why this industry has built up. You know, obviously, um, Korea being an exporter, they, you know, have perfected a lot of different technologies within the country. You know, the same thing when it comes to car making and things like that. They have huge factories. They've developed all these different technologies to build everything so that they can then export it overseas and sell it. So it didn't just sort of come up, you know, out of the blue one day, even though I know K-Beauty has really only been talked about overseas probably since I would say 2012, 2013, 2014 is when it really started taking off overseas. But this industry has been quietly sort of building up. Uh, People are getting more expertise and like entire factories uh, and markets were developing behind the scenes uh, in Korea for a long time before that happened. So I recently posted a tile on my Instagram account showing who owns who in K-beauty. So like a visual representation of who the big umbrella companies are. So like the L'Oreal of Korea, if you will, like who owns all these different companies underneath their Uh, umbrella brand. Uh, Amore Pacific is one of the big ones. Uh, And then obviously LG Household and Healthcare, like I mentioned. So just to run you guys through, I'm not going to list off everything. If you want to have a look at it, go and check out um, my Instagram account, which is at lauren.kbeauty, just because there are that many brands. But just some of the brands that Amore Pacific owns include Amore Pacific, obviously, Aratam, Espoir, Etude House, Hanyul, Happy Bath, Hera, Iliun, Innisfree, Iope, Laneige, Mamond, they own Orsudoc, they own Primera, Solwasu, 
uh, many, many more brands as well. Um, LG Household and Healthcare, another one of the really big ones, they own the history of who? Oh, Huey. On the body, SUM37, and Able CNC is the umbrella brand that owns Misha, a Pew, and a whole range of other brands. So a lot of the wealth, I think, is concentrated in some of the really, really big conglomerates, and they are the big players in K-Beauty. They obviously, a company like Amore Pacific, they have even like research labs, um, that are part of their wider overall umbrella of companies where they can conduct all their own in-house research testing, you know, to create like new ingredients, new concepts and things like that. So they are in a very different stratosphere from the indie beauty brands, the smaller brands, um, you know, that are independently owned, maybe that are just still coming up in the industry. Obviously those um, bigger conglomerates have massive marketing budgets. They have like entire buildings in Seoul that are like, you know, huge high rise buildings. They have their own legal teams. They have a whole um, apparatus of people that work for them to promote and build up the brands um, overseas. So that is why they are the names that you will see in the duty free stores overseas. You will see them in department stores. Um, I know I was speaking with someone on Instagram the other day that was telling me where some of these brands are positioned in France. So it's really interesting to see how they uh, market, sell and position all of their different brands in various different countries. So in some countries, they will be a duty free free brand in other countries, a department store brand, and then in others, they might uh, go into um, Sephora or stores like that, or Mecca in Australia, uh, some of the really big, um, I guess, offline stores that specialize in a whole range of different beauty products. So they are the big players in the market. Um, and the other thing, I guess, that is then interesting to, to take a look at is well, how are the brands going about manufacturing these products? Like, how do they actually get made? And next week, what I'm planning to do is step through all the different pro like parts of the process that are actually going into making a single beauty product. But today, for this, this first part, I thought it might be better to look at a sort of umbrella or helicopter approach to the industry in general. So planning and launching is one of the things that I think distinguishes K-beauty from Western beauty brands. So research and development, which we just call R&D in the industry, for many Western brands can take years. But K-beauty brands usually are much, much quicker at planning and launching their products. Many brands spend less than six months on that. And you can see this because Korea has much more of a fast beauty approach. They are much quicker in responding to new trends. And that usually makes the products much more affordable as well because, you know, in order to recoup their expenses, if you're a Western beauty brand and you've spent two years developing a single product, obviously throughout that time, you couldn't earn any money from it. So you are needing to recoup the last two years that you spent on your research and development when you start selling the product. Whereas in Korea, if you've only spent six months, then obviously it's going to be quicker to then push that out and you can start recouping your expenses a lot quicker. So that's why you'll often see K-beauty brands doing things like collaborations with Disney, with different characters. Um, you know, I've seen so many different kinds of collaborations that K-Beauty brands do. I think Etude House has one with Hershey's and they do like little palettes, little makeup palettes that have, you know, the Hershey's chocolate colors on them, things like that. They can respond much, much quicker. Um, and they also can stay on top of consumer feedback. So I've spoken before on the podcast when I did another episode on K-beauty in Korea about apps that Koreans love to use, things like Huahe, where they go on and sort of see, well, what's everyone else saying about a, a certain product? What kind of rankings does it have? What do people like about it? Well, the brands are very, very sensitive to trends like that, and they will spend time on the apps, on, um, you know, all sorts of different review sites 
having a look. What are people saying? What do they like about something? What do they not like? You know, it, at the moment, it seems like fragrance is a bit on the nose <laughs> in inverted commas. And, you know, consumers are saying, well, I want fragrance free products. Okay, well, if that's the trend and that's what people want, then that's what they're going to give them. You know, if um, a new ingredient comes up that all of a sudden everyone is really responding well to, then they will re- release their own line featuring, you know, Seeker or propolis or probiotics, whatever the trend of the day is. So that whole process, I think, is very, very different in Korea compared to in other markets that I've seen. You know, I think the the old Western approach used to just be a lot more around, you know, we build the products and then um, market them to people. Whereas in Korea, it's a lot more trying to respond to what the people are actually asking for and then making them as quickly as possible so that they can respond to that demand. So when it comes to then the manufacturing, and again, I'm going to break this down into a lot more detail in next week's episode, but the bigger brands like Amore Pacific and LG Household and Healthcare have the capability and the capacity to manufacture their own products in-house. So they have their own uh, labs, they have their own factories, but Even the biggest brands I have noticed will outsource some parts of their manufacturing to other labs. And that's particularly the case if a product is trending or their regular supplier maybe can't keep up with the demand. Um, So there are literally labs all over Korea that are manufacturing for a whole host of different brands, um, sizes, products, everything like that. And, you know, you will find that some of the smaller labs have a really close relationship with one particular brand and they manufacture a lot of their stuff. Um, So that's sort of how that gets done. But in general, there are, I guess, a couple of different ways that uh, products in general get made in Korea. And I'd say the three main ways are OEM, which is short for Original Equipment Manufacturing, ODM, which stands for Original Design Manufacturing, and then White Label. So White Label are probably, it's probably the easiest to explain because I think most people are generally familiar with it. They are the products that are manufactured by a contractor or a third party manufacturer, but are sold under a retailer's brand name. So it will usually be the very same product that is being sold to lots of different retailers. Basically, the formula has already been produced and companies are just adding their own label to it. Um, And some white label manufacturers will allow the companies or the brands rather to make minor changes to an existing formula they've got on their shelf. Maybe you can add like a small percentage of your signature ingredient or your signature fragrance. So this is a good option, I guess, for brands that are going for speed. If the product has already been made, then they just need to package it and market it um, and it can help them to control their pricing basically. Um, The disadvantage with white labeling is obviously that the same or a very similar product can be produced by competing companies but that is probably the method that I think a lot of people know out there know exists out in the world. So OEM which is um, original equipment manufacturing is what it stands for. That is when a brand goes to a manufacturer to produce a certain product exclusively to their specifications. So basically the client would do all the market research, all the research and development and develop its own products, but maybe it doesn't have like the manufacturing capability to fulfill the market demand in time. So it will turn to an OEM company to do the manufacturing part on its behalf. Uh, And this is where it might surprise you to know that many Western companies actually do this in Korea. So they turn to Korean OEMs to do that work for them. And just some of the companies that do this in Korea include Lancome, L'Oreal, YSL, Johnson & Johnson, Mary Kay, Herbalife, um, Avon. There are heaps more as well. So that's really, really, really common. Um, for Western companies, oh, they know exactly what they want to make, but they're giving it to someone else to actually manufacture it. So that is um, 
a big part of the industry here. It's not just Korean companies making Korean beauty products for the Korean market or for the global market. It's actually companies from all over the world that come to Korea because they have this capability and they have this industry built up. It's got a great reputation for this kind of thing. A lot of Western companies come and do that here in Korea. So if you turn around some of your makeup and skincare products and have a look, they will have, uh, well, they should have um, a section on it that says made in blah, wherever the product was made. And I am always very surprised to see just how many products really are made in Korea, even if they're not um, being marketed or promoted maybe as a Korean product. So flip some of yours over and just see if you can find a few that are also made in Korea that you maybe didn't know about. You will be surprised. Um, that That's like one of the things that I love doing, particularly when I'm shopping overseas, is just to check out where everything's made. Um, so yeah, that I know a lot of products in, in the US market in particular are actually made in Korea. So that can be a little bit of a, a fun thing if you want to have an investigation for yourself and see where your products are actually made. The other way that products are frequently created here is through ODM companies, so original design manufacturing. So an ODM is a company basically that is capable of designing and producing products according to specifications provided by the brand for all intents and purposes. So the seller, the person that's going to sell the product, which is the brand. And they create the overall design and specifications of the products that are then sold by the cosmetic companies under their own names. So basically an ODM company will turn a brand's concept and formulation into actual cosmetic products. So they take care of the R&D, the product concepts, the testing and the manufacturing. They basically or actually are the ones that directly develop and make the product. So some of Korea's biggest OEM and ODM companies include Korean Colma, Cosmax, Cosmeca, uh, Koson, uh, who own Mizon or Mizon, the brand. So they are some of the really big names in Korean manufacturing, I guess. So I thought then just for a little bit of fun, I would go through who actually makes what in K-Beauty. So where are the products that you are using actually made? So like I mentioned, Cosmax is one of the really big ones and they are a very R&D oriented manufacturer. So what they're doing is they're actually developing new technologies, they hold lots of different patents for various different cosmetics, and they actually do make some of the world's most popular beauty products. Apparently, according to their brand, to Cosmax, one out of 11 people all over the world use a Cosmax cosmetic product. Uh, They have 600 brands in over 100 different countries. So some of the K-Beauty brands who manufacture with Cosmax include The Face Shop, Misha, uh, Mimi Box, Olive Young, AHC, Dr. Jart, Style Nanda, Too Cool for School, Tony Moly, Nature Republic, The Sem, Enprani, Vanilla Co, and Mediheal. So that's just some of them. So that's Cosmax, a really big one. Uh, Another one is Colmar, so K-O-L-M-A-R. And Colmar actually runs nine different labs for cosmetics research and development, including for makeup, skincare, personal care, skin science, packaging and fragrances, just to name a few. So they literally hold thousands of registrations for functional cosmetics. Um, And we spoke about them before as well. They are the ones that have benefits like wrinkle care, uh, what what they call whitening or brightening in K-beauty and sun care. Um, And they also have thousands of patents as well. So some of the Korean brands produced by Colma are Innisfree, Um, And this is not necessarily to say that all of these brands do all of their products through 
that manufacturer, but just that some of the products in their line will be manufactured by Colmar. So Innisfree, Nature Republic, Etude House, Too Cool for School, Dr. Jart, AHC, The Sem, Misha, Thank You Pharma, Herborian, It's Skin, Skin79, Goodall, Cynic, 3CE, Clavu, Hanskin, The Face Shop, and Huxley. So plenty of names that I'm sure that you guys will recognize if you have been looking into K-Beauty or using K-Beauty products for a while. So that is just what I wanted to cover today. Obviously, this is a like really huge topic, but I just thought, you know, it's a little bit different. We don't always talk about where our products come from, how they come to be made. It's the same with our food, right? You don't really think when it's sitting on your plate how did it get here but this is the kind of work I guess that people like myself are doing here on the ground in Korea like this is a big part of the work that I do um, whether it is for my own brand um, for you know the brands that we consult with we do a lot of consulting work for people that are looking to manufacture in Korea uh, and anyone that's really working in the industry in Korea this is like a large part of what they're actually doing so I thought it might be interesting to you guys to just, you know, know a little bit more about this whole process and how it comes to be. So that is, I'm going to finish here because I'm about to lose my voice, I think. But if you did like today's episode, I would love for you to share it on social media and tag me. I am at lauren.kbeauty. Obviously, if you are interested in manufacturing in Korea, get in touch with our team. We work with companies from all over the world to launch and manufacture their products. Um, So yeah, and I will be back with another episode for you guys for next week. In the meantime, I'll see you on Style Story.